morning. Happy Super Bowl Monday. Uh, we're going to get off to the fastest start that we can, uh, given that this should be a national holiday. Welcome to uh, post-overtime Super Bowl. We talk about Penn State football. We'll get the mailbag open. So if you've got a question for us, um, drop it in the chat. We'll be answering those at the end of the show. Want to give you enough time to formulate your questions. Take Brown had a big night. Donovan Smith gets another Super Bowl. Um, and Penn State's top opponents, big changes for them this offseason. We want to discuss that a little bit, the, the kind of surrounding ecosystem that Penn State football is in. That's all coming up on the show today. Uh, the people discussing it with me and the experts here to give you the answers about what's going on. Nate Bauer, Blue White Illustrated Senior Editor, Publisher, Sean Fitz. Fitz, how you doing today? I know you had two Super Bowl, you had two parties yesterday. How you feeling? And what was the what was the hit of the parties? What was the everyone's favorite food? Oh, I'm feeling the effects. Is that what's that's what I'm feeling? Um, <laughs> not a big drinker, but it was a long. It was it was more of a marathon yesterday. So yeah, we did what we had to do. Um, Nate was there, fashionably late. So thanks for thanks for coming by. Um, no, it was good. My, my, my oldest turned 10 yesterday. So we had the family party and then we had the Super Bowl party because I host that every year. So back to back parties, um, ragers, as you would expect by just looking at me here. Um, but, uh, <laughs> in true dad fashion, smoked a pork butt, smoked a brisket, smoked a chicken, smoked pretty much everything. Um, and it was, uh, Sorry, pretty much everything, and uh, it was uh, it was a good time. Any, any, Rogue Shop any isn't a sponsor at the at the moment, so it's all right. <laughs> the The brisket was a delight, Fitz. Just Thank top notch as always. It's what I expect from you. Fitz, the expectation uh, is the expectation. We know that we covered Tom Bradley. That's right, <laughs> Nate. Uh, there's some basketball. Uh, so uh, yeah, what happened? Uh, the, the preamble, the yeah. appetizer to the evening's football festivities was a loss to Northwestern. Yeah. Everybody got so worked up over the football game. And I was like, there's a Penn state basketball game today. What's what's, uh, everybody else was distracted. No Penn state lost, uh, a game that had a, a strange, like, it was in conflict, right? Because they lost. And so Mike Rhodes, obviously, and, and the perception is, okay, well, you missed an opportunity and they did, but I think it would be hard to argue that they didn't play the style of basketball that Penn state is hoping to have. And so, yes, you miss shots. You hope that those go in, uh, you got, they got crushed on the offensive glass, right? Uh, Northwestern ended up having 13 offensive rebounds. I think they ended up with a 18 points off of second chance points. And so that was, that was a game. It was, it was a pretty cut and dry. This is, this is why you lost. Uh, but also given the trajectory of this season, uh, some signs of encouragement, right? Some, some reasons mm -hmm. for optimism that, the things that they've been trying to implement are actually happening and guys are buying in and uh, you know, you can, you can even in a loss on the road against a good team, you can, you can build on that going forward. Penn state basketball plays Michigan at home tomorrow state. night at six 30 Michigan. Th sorry, Michigan state tomorrow at Wednesday. 6 30. Wednesday. What is today? I'm used today's to doing this on Tuesdays. Yeah. Today's yeah. And this is why the Super Bowl should be a Saturday. Exactly. Right. It's I didn't a, even drink last night. I'm just confused because it's a different. Monday and I'm talking to you. <laughs> the, 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 help, the helpful thing uh, to remember is that it's on Valentine's Day. Yes. So my wife is over the moon. Date so night. pleased that mm -hmm. I will be spending uh, my Wednesday evening at the Bryce Jordan Center uh, and not taking her out to dinner. The what, Bryce what I, Center on Valentine's Day is like the oh. uh, hot tub in Dumb and Dumber when <laughs> Harry and Lloyd are sitting in the heart. That's basically basically <laughs> the same thing. And it, but it's going to be me by myself. So anyway, yeah, go ahead. Let's let's not paint a lonelier <laughs> picture. Let's let's not let's not go further down that road. What I was trying to set up and and uh, fell flat on my face with is we're going to have a, a hoop show this week and uh, talking about a bunch of this stuff. So uh, Nate and I will get together on when that happens and how that happens. But make sure you stay tuned for that later in the week. It'll be live uh, or, or taped uh, taped live here on the on the YouTube channel when we get to that. So we'll let you know uh, social media blue at illustrated .com when that's coming up. Um, Fitz Super Bowl last night, uh, Penn State Nittany Lions 
factored heavily into the game. What did you think about, uh, first off, just your general thoughts on the Super Bowl? How, how did you enjoy that experience? Oh, terrible first half, but it turned out to be entertaining. So I was fine and I stayed awake, which was, I mean, that was plus odds if you were betting on that. <laughs> um, but no, it was, uh, it was, it was really fun to watch Tig, man. Like, uh, yeah. this guy who we know him as that guy, like we've, we've watched him at Penn state as that guy who just finds the football for whatever stereotype you want to throw at him. He did it again, uh, in the, on the biggest stage. I think it's awesome. Uh, again, one of the best stories to come out of Penn State football in, in recent years, like just a, a guy that was not in this direction at all. Now, all of a sudden he's in the Super Bowl. I, it, at one point, he was like the fourth leading odds getter for Super Bowl MVP. Like, think about that. Like, wrap yeah. your head around that in a game with Patrick Mahomes and Christian McCaffrey. That is so awesome for him. Um, you know, I hope uh, I hope he's all right. And I, did he come back in the game after he, he got hit? Um, yeah. yeah. Kind of looked so, like a stinger because it, it was his shoulder and he was flexing his hand and then he came back later in the game. Gotcha. Yeah. And that's uh, that's awesome that he got back there because that was I mean, Pat, Patrick Mahomes doesn't look like a big guy out there. But if you ran into Patrick Mahomes, it would probably hurt. Um, so yeah. uh, really cool to see that get the pick. I think he had 11 tackles. He's all over the place. Um, yeah. What a third round pick, man. Like. Four, six, five doesn't look so bad out on that uh, Super Bowl field. So uh, good for good for Tig. Uh, he's earned every bit of it along the way. And hopefully it continues to earn and gets to his next contract and makes it all. I mean, it's already all worthwhile for him, but uh, in the Super Bowl. But uh, here yeah, I, it was interesting on, on the deep pass. I, they did a good job of showing um, how the coverage was supposed to rotate and how he kind of looked like he was left out to dry by Gibson, the other safety where he's over top of the play. He's supposed to have some help and some sports underneath. And then you, you want to make the play in that situation. You need to make the play in the situation, but I don't think that was like, you can't pin that fully on him on that deep pass that set them up. Ultimately that re resulted in zero points with the fumble. I think two plays later, uh, Donovan Smith uh, before, actually, before we move on one thing that bothered me last night and Tony Romo, he's fine. He's a fun golden retriever style color guy. He's very excited. I'm very excited that he's very excited. But one thing that bothered me, and I think to talk about Tig and what uh, San Francisco was doing, they, he kept hammering home. They were keeping him in the pocket. And that's true. And they had a guy in his face. But it doesn't matter if you aren't forcing him off his first read. And, and the San Francisco defense was doing a great job of making him hold on to the football and then bail from the pocket. So just something I thought was really interesting in that game was early on how and really throughout the game how they were able to keep the kansas city offense off balance and take away those deep shots and and two defenses that kind of play similarly of that new two two high coverage shell in the nfl how they were able to combat some of the best quarterbacks and some of the best offensive systems in the nfl uh donovan smith by the way, that, that's exactly the conversation Nate and I were having last night watching the that's Super Bowl. So I'm sure. glad you covered it for us. <laughs> yeah, thank you. Donovan Smith is creeping up there as, a, as an all-timer for Penn Staters in the NFL. Two Super Bowls now. One with Tom Brady, one with Patrick Mahomes. Um, is this is is this the end, do you think, for him in terms of do you think he rides off into the sunset here? Boy, that's tough because those contracts are nice if you're <laughs> if you're a left tackle. Um, yeah. So like it, it depends. I know he's I know he signed a big one in Tampa, um, and obviously those guys are in demand. Hey, good for Donovan. Uh, it, it's funny because he's one of the I would say most hated guy. Like that that's a, probably a bad way to put it, but like in terms of Penn State fans, how they feel about him, like they didn't like the way that he left. Um, didn't think that he was drafted where he should have been like he drafted too high. And then all of a sudden he's, he's got two Super Bowl rings 10 years later. So like, it's, it's very funny to watch the development of that, um, throughout the process. I, it's Penn state fans unfairly ding guys when they leave early, when they, when people, mm -hmm. when people th don't think they should leave early. Um, and I think that that's Donovan Smith, who is a guy that kind of proved, not proves my point, but like, if you're an average offensive lineman, you're a good offensive lineman. Like it's, it's very interesting to watch like how hard it is to block those mutants that are out there <laughs> going after the quarterback yeah. because that the defensive line has changed more, probably more than anybody else in the last decade or so. Um, so for him to be able to stand in front of that and do what he does, like that makes a good offensive lineman and he gets beat and he holds and he does all that kind of stuff. But at the end of the day, man, those guys are making a lot of money because there aren't too many of them out there. And he's made the, certainly made the most of it. And, and I think that there's a fair comparison between him and Rasheed Walker of guys that are yep. ultra talented and didn't really have anyone to push them. 
at yep. Penn State. And that kind of led to who they were and how they've now both, you know, a long time starting left tackle in the NFL and a guy who won a left tackle job and looks like he's going to supplant a uh, borderline Hall of Famer and David Bakhtiari in Green Bay with Rasheed Walker. Am, uh, am, they, I, am I just making that up in my head that like people slight Donovan just because of like the way that it's gone? No, like, I, is that... I agree. I, I completely agree. And I think that that's also part of the conversation of a little bit of unrealized talent too, where somebody who could have been like a first round pick could have been the next Penn State offensive lineman had those skills. He still went in the second round, but I absolutely agree with you there that there is that, that kind of like little rough patch in, in your feelings about a guy who didn't maximize their potential uh, during their time in college. Nate, you, you had a, you had a thought. Well, he, not, he, he was he was the genesis, like the origin story of James Franklin's talking point about not having competition behind people, right? Like that yeah. he he was the, you know, and James Franklin always kind of subtweets people. He doesn't actually come out and say like, oh, this was, this is, Don, right? But Donovan right. Smith was his shining example of, hey, here's a, like, because of where Penn State was at that time, Donovan Smith came into the program. It was a big deal, right? I mean, he was he was a uh, a quote unquote super six guy, if I'm not mistaken, right? Okay. Absolutely. And but there was but there it was just the cupboard was empty behind him, and so he could kind of uh, fairly or not, I'm gonna say it, loaf his way through his Penn State career. He didn't. There was no. There's nothing to say, hey, like if you're not on it, we have somebody that we can replace you with that can motivate you to to bring out the best of you. So it's uh it's it's kind of a fascinating historically context look at where Penn State was then, who he was, mm-hmm. and where he is now and where Penn State is now. Fitz, do you think Penn State's there now? Uh specifically at tackle with uh the guys that they have do you not that i'm saying uh drew shelton has any issues with working hard and you know pushing himself the way that he came into penn state and quickly developed both physically and and from that other you know from a technical side but do they have a guy where if he's not getting it done do they have the depth of that position where they now have that competition where they can make those hard choices? Because even with Rashid Walker and having Olu behind him it felt like there were some maybe some injuries or some things behind the scenes where it it was clear that Rashid was the guy and there was no question about that. Yeah, I think so. And it's, and it's actually funny because when we were talking to people in the off season after Rashid left and Olu was, you know, sort of blossoming, they said the, like the people in the program were adamant. I think we might be better at left tackle. Like we're going to miss Rashid's talent, but Olu may end up being better. And that, I mean, blew it out of the water, but uh, yeah. no, I mean, it's, I, I think it's a, it's a question in transition because is Caden Wallace as good as Caden Wallace was this year? If he doesn't have Drew Shelton playing like Drew Shelton played in 2022, I don't know that he is, but you know, and it's certainly a credit to Caden, the way that he's, he blossomed there at the end of his career um, this year. I don't, I don't know. You've got Drew, you've got um, Dunka who seems to be like, he's my pick for a guy that's going to break out at some point. Um, whether that's like right away or not, I don't know. And now you've got Rucci in there too. Um, so it's it's probably on a smaller scale like you, you the the two guys that just left great football player like yeah. elite prospect and also really really good football player probably underappreciated throughout his time and then ended on a on a, on a high note there but uh so you're that that question is i think kind of in transition right now because it's, you're, it's just a complete reset of tackle yeah it's and it's a hard position to find guys that can compete especially if you get one that you really like and you know i was going back and looking at some uh some rasheed walker highlights from high school and oh boy Mm -hmm. i reminded myself how much like he was a standout player with all of that talent and certain guys are intrinsically motivated olu it seemed like didn't need competition to make himself great but at the same time you'd like to have it both ways uh which is is um you just at that position, you it's harder to find those guys to do that. And 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 Olu really got better behind Rashid. Like that that is where he made his biggest strides was getting ready for that show. Like it was it was not a situation. Like it's one of those situations where you you do the Rocky training montage without filming it. Like that's yeah. that's what he did that entire year. Came out in the Outback Bowl, gotten some guys way, and did, you know, got some confidence out of that, and 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 rightfully so. And then just kind of rolled that over into the off season. So. So, you know, if you're trying to 
supplant this and take it to this current team right now. I mean, maybe Donka is that guy that can make that same adjustment, albeit a year sooner than, than Olu would have had to do it. So one of the things I wanted to talk about today on the show is some of the changes outside of Penn State. We focused a lot on Penn State's uh, internal things as far as three new off three new coordinators, offense, defense, and special teams. Uh, but they're not the only program in transition. Ohio State, massive changes. Or excuse me, Michigan has massive, massive changes. Ohio State hiring an offensive coordinator after Bill O'Brien agreed to be the offensive coordinator then left to be the head coach at Boston College. So lots of upheaval and uh, a little bit of chaos for the Buckeyes. So how does all of that affect Penn State from a broad perspective is kind of what we want to dig into now. If you have any comments, you have any questions, uh, throw them in the chat for the mailbag. We'll, we'll talk about this stuff and your opinions on this. Um, we've got Mac who says, Mac the Mustard Man says, Chip Kelly's horrible acquisition in 2024. Great news for Penn State is how he feels about that. But uh, this late in the process, Nate, making these big changes for Ohio State, how do you think this affects them considering some of the things they've done from the portal and balancing those two things? Yeah, how, how are their players? Do they have good players? I think they're Yeah, I think good. so. Ohio State has good oh, They'll be good. <laughs> Stop it okay. with the scientific and analytics, Nate. Yeah, for real. I, uh, uh, I have a, a deep... And uh, abiding faith that players win games, and uh, you know, yeah, a, a Chip 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 Kelly's going to be like. Maybe you don't want to have this conversation yet. I think that we'll get to it. But uh, a fascinating, another example of guys who, right? There are lanes in the profession. And some guys are head coaches and some guys are coordinators and excel at being coordinators. And there are guys certainly who can take that coordinator position to the head coach, right? They can, mm -hmm. they can write Kyle Shanahan calls. Play, is that right? Does he call yes. plays? Yeah. Okay. Uh, so, so you have some of that in the NFL. Uh, certainly you have some of that in college football, but I, I just, I think that overwhelmingly, uh, you know, some guys who are great coordinators can't make that jump to, to head coaching because it's not it's not about making the jump to head coaching. It's about leadership and it's about organizational management. Like they're just they're different responsibilities. They're different tasks. And sometimes they carry over. Sometimes they overlap and sometimes they don't. But uh, right in, in terms of the perception uh, of this one specifically, Chip Kelly's offense is did pretty well, right? Like, I mean, over, over the years, uh, as a, when he was a coordinator, he had quite a bit of success and that gave him the opportunity to become a head coach. I think in a reduced role where you don't have to deal with the 5 million other things that are on your plate as a head coach, you could just be a coordinator uh, and $50 million worth of players that Ohio state has. <laughs> he'll be okay. Yeah, he'll be pretty good. Fitz, what do you think of the fit um, with Ryan Day and what they've done traditionally to what Chip Kelly has done traditionally? And I know there's some you can point to the Eagles in the NFL where he didn't use as much of uh, the read option. But quarterback running has traditionally been a big part of Chip Kelly offenses and, and the run game in a lot of ways has been what leads them. Is this an indication from Ryan Day that oh, we want to be more physical, which he said for two years straight, and now they're bringing in a different system? I guess, how do you see all of that going with Day being an offensive guy and Kelly being an offensive guy, and they're kind of not completely in alignment in terms of how they've, uh, you know, how they've cut that up and, and processed that? Yeah, I think that's the interesting thing because the, the criticism for Chip Kelly has been the lack of like adjusting from your adjusting your system to yeah. when everybody figures it out. And that's, that's kind of been his downfall is that like, Hey, this was absolutely like off the charts out of this world 10 years ago. And yeah. now all of a sudden you're trying to do some of the same things and people, you know, it's a lot easier to defend now. And that's, that's just evolution of, of play calling and that's evolution of scheme and things like that. So I think that that's going to be the interesting thing is, is colliding what Ryan day has done because day has been the guy leading that offense um, and, you know, trying to figure out how, I don't want to say it, it, it's so odd saying this because you're Ohio state, but how to feature those receivers a little bit more, especially when you bring in a big money running back like yeah. that, 
it's going to be fascinating because they have the pieces. I mean, there's no question to me that they have the pieces. The offensive line, we're, we're going to see what it is. I mean, it's it, it's getting the other guy's way. Um, but Will Howard is just I, – I, I don't see Will Howard and think Chip Kelly, but also – I see him and I think, okay, he can be Chip Kelly enough, you know, if right. that makes sense. So I think they're going to have the pieces. I think they're going to be fine. Um, and I think Chip Kelly not having to do the CEO stuff, like, is invaluable to what you can bring on board. At the same time, and th Nate, this is the conversation I really want to have about where we are in college football. A Big Ten head coach at UCLA, I know it's weird to say, leaving a school, leaving a head coaching position for another big 10 school to be the offensive coordinator that's not a lateral move that's a move downward but it feels like we're just ripping the band-aid off and and everything is just out in the open the club within the club has become more obvious to me it seems is that the case to you and is this furthering the dystopia of what college football was and what it is now when you say the club within the club what do you mean so there's there's a there's a number of schools that generally we all agree can compete for a college football playoff that is wider now with 12. ucla they are not in the club ohio state michigan you maybe would put washington but again a lot of upheaval there um and then the sec schools like there's there's the number of schools that you think can, can compete for a national championship the top of the top and then you have the second tier of schools that can fight and compete and it seems like to me a coach that was somewhat on a hot seat or somewhat interested, like might've been let go, might've left. And then suddenly he just leaves so yeah. late in the year. Like this is kind of odd. This is an odd thing. This is not something I I've seen before personally from any sort of college football, how things work. Yeah. Um, hmm. Where do we start on this for the blue white illustrated subscribers? Uh, who followed Penn State's offensive coordinator search in November, this shouldn't come as a complete surprise. All right. From there, uh, what I will say is college football coaching is uh, the definition of misery. It, it is an awful profession that no one likes um, well, no, that's not true. Let me correct myself. Some people like it. Some and, people are pretty masochistic out there, Nate. <laughs> and they're crazy. Those people are crazy. They're generally crazy. They're just, um, they, they have an affinity for something that is otherwise pretty miserable. Now there are two exceptions, maybe three, uh, and Fitz, you can correct this if I'm wrong. I don't understand recruiting the way that you do, but offense and defensive coordinator, in the, in the college football sphere uh, have significantly different recruiting responsibilities uh, than everybody else on the staff. So that's the head coach and then all of the other assistants, the, the position coaches um, and what their foot soldier kind of responsibilities are. It's just, it's just, they are worlds apart. And so there are, those are the two appealing jobs right now in college football. But otherwise, uh, Greg sent us a, a tweet, I think, from somebody, and I'm paraphrasing it, but it's it was something to the effect of, would you rather be uh, a head coach in the NFL or a coach in the NFL or a coach in college football? And the guy's response was like, the, the, the NFL, uh, I like seeing my children. Like, I mean, that's it. Like, you don't, you don't have a, a normal life. It's just not a normal existence. Uh, in college football. And to be honest with you at James Franklin's uh, Penn state, right. You, you see this, right? Like, uh, James Franklin's work ethic is being in the office all day, every day. You, you turn the lights on in the morning when it's dark outside, you shut the lights off at night when after your children have gone to bed. And so the time to see your family, the time to be a human is, at the end of practice, as you're walking off the field, your wife and children have come to the last practice facility and like you get to say hi there. <laughs> like, <What a> treat. <laughs> yeah, like 
I, I mean, I just, I, I, I understand the perception of this, like how it's going to come across as, oh, well, these guys make hundreds of thousands of dollars as assistant coaches or coordinators, head coach, right? I mean, in James Franklin's case, it's eight and a half million dollars plus, right? But, um, uh, you know, there is a reason that people like to golf. There, there's a reason that people like to do human things that like have a hobby have a hot, like just do something other than your job all the time. And in college football, you can't do that. Or if you do, if those are the things that you enjoy to do, and that's the way that the program is being run, you're falling behind against other people that aren't running their program that way. They're running their program as constant all the time. This is a great segue because I want to ask Fitz about the Michigan situation. Um, and a couple of different layers. We can start with Wing Martindale. Again, it feels like a curious fit of a guy who left the New York Giants to pursue head coaching opportunities in the NFL, is how it was phrased. And now he's in college after all the NFL jobs were filled, and he's going to Michigan as the defensive coordinator. So a guy who, I, I apologize, I didn't look to see, I didn't have time this morning to, to see if he has previous college coaching experience, but how do you see that fit at Michigan, I know Penn State doesn't play them this year, but Michigan's performance next year will dictate the Big Ten standings in one way or another. How do you view that fit? So I, I'm kind of taking a different angle on this because I think it's fine because I don't think he's going to be there long enough to find the strain of recruiting and like be accountable for the strain of recruit. Like if he doesn't like yeah. recruiting, that's going to show up in three years and he's probably not going to be there in three years. This guy's a really talented defensive uh, coordinator. He's been in the game for a long time. So I don't know how much longer he's playing in the coach. So it's an odd fit, but at the same time, like the whole, he doesn't like recruiting. So why would he go back into college? Bill O'Brien had this conversation um, like that. That is kind of off the table to me right now. Um, I think it's, I think it's one of those things where you're just bringing in a ball coach to coach ball. And gotcha. there aren't too many spots like that. Nate mentioned offensive defensive coordinator, sort of the, uh, the shining examples of the the jobs in demand right now because of that. Um, so I think I think they'll be okay in that. Um, the rest of the whole turnover there, it's they have a lot going against them right now. Um, yeah, I, I I don't know if players will end up bailing off of this, but they seem to have kept it together, circled the wagons, do what do what Michigan does. Um, but I think he'll be fine as a defense coordinator just because he is so good at what he does. Um, you know, Giants withstanding. Um, but uh, it's uh, it, it, it's a good fit for now. I could see it being a problem later, but I think mm -hmm. that like you're going to be able to coach them up. And that's, I mean, Nate, if you remember covering Bill, that was the thing. Like, hey, we need to mask our deficiencies, our roster deficiencies. And Michigan has fewer roster deficiencies than Penn State dealt with a decade ago. Um, but uh, we need to mask it by being and out coaching them. And some guys can do that. I think Wink Martin you know, probably can. Um, mm -hmm. It's going to be about the rest of the guys on that staff as well. He's an interesting one, Nate. Do you, before I say something, no. do you have any thoughts on the situation? No, no. Uh, you go ahead. He is similar in a lot of ways to Don Brown, with the pressure and the aggressiveness and the playing cover one. There's also a little Manny Diaz in there because it is not as much. You know, Don Brown plays. Uh, the whole point was Don Brown plays one coverage. They just press coverage the whole time, and if they have better athletes, they win. There's more zone pressures, and but it is hyper aggressive from Wink Martindale. So I'll be interested to see how that fits with Michigan and their. Um, because even though he spent a lot of time with the Baltimore Ravens, this is a different system than the cross pollination between uh, the two uh, programs, Michigan and the Ravens than it was, I think, than um, uh, McDonald, I think, was the defense coordinator a couple years ago. So I, I just it's an interesting, it's going to be an interesting fit, see how he adjusts the college level and what uh, what he brings there. Um, He's only 60. My God. Sorry. <laughs> I said that without muted. He looks, he, he looks like he lives it on hard mode. <laughs> That's, uh, some people look like that, you know. Okay. You, you don't always look like, uh, like, uh, like Usher last night. My wife was like, hey, you know, he's 45. And I said, what now? What? He's 45? That's amazing. Uh, any other thoughts? I guess the, the last question is. And does a great this... dancer, too. Unbelievable. Yes. I guess it's like if, if singing and dancing is your career versus trying to stop Tom Brady for eight years. Like there are different levels of 
stress and fatigue and cortisol that go into those things. Sure. Uh, Nate, does yeah. any of this change the pecking order in the Big Ten to you? All of these changes in Penn State's mm. position uh, within the conference, do you think Michigan's dra brain drain with guys – in staff going to the Chargers and um, Ohio State having some hiccups and some drama of their coaching staff changing here in February. Does any of that change the Penn State's opportunity next year? Yeah, I don't have a great uh, grasp on Michigan's personnel. I, I, I mean, the narrative and the storyline this season was that so many of those guys were in their last year, right? It was like, yeah. That, that was it. Obviously, McCarthy's gone. Um, yeah, so quarterback makes a difference. Yeah. Yeah. I, I think Oregon, I, I think Oregon upsets things in the power ranking structure more than the Michigan changes. I mean, that's just like when you're looking at the top. So, yeah. Yeah. So, but, but I think uh, Washington, you're expecting to take a step back. Uh, Michigan, you're ex expecting to take a step back. Ohio State, you're expecting to be uh, a, a hell bent cyborg of a program <laughs> right <laughs> right to save ryan day's job to appease the fans to right, right. i mean they, they are um beside themselves uh in frustration so yeah they're they're gonna be pretty crazy and uh but i mean uh southern cal I, I, like i don't know but uh, long way of saying michigan ohio state penn state oregon now Oregon now. Yeah. Then probably USC. Southern Cal. Yeah. So, Fitz, this is the last question before we get to the mailbag. Uh, yes or no, is fourth in the Big Ten good enough to get to the playoff? I, I just, this is a kind of a question of I don't really know how it'll all work out with four conferences and 12 teams and all that stuff. Is four, Do you think fourth is good enough to get one of those at-large bids? I don't think so. I think third is probably the, the, the level there. Um, I, I think it's going to be interesting because – I do think there will be a nine win team in the playoff this year or maybe, maybe next year, but it, Penn state doesn't have that. It's not gonna be Penn state. Like if that makes sense. So like if, if LSU or Alabama wins nine games and it's con, you know, conceivably tougher from the outside or whatever, then I think that that's a nine win team that can get in. Um, you know, I think Penn state is going to have to win 10 and I think that would be okay. Looking at the schedule, it looks a lot better now with, with the upheaval in Washington. Like that yeah. was a game that you circled. And now you're like, I'm wondering not, not to the sense that they're going to feel a team, but like, how's that all going to come together? Um, obviously a big chance for them to, to, to flip it with a portal, but same time, like that's, that's kind of how we, how we look at that. So um, I, I think the, the potential is there. So you're looking at three to five in my, in my opinion, I think Ohio state's number one, I think Oregon's number two. We'll see with Michigan. We'll see with USC if they get a defense and then, Penn State's yeah. as Penn State's as solid on the line as as you can be, but obviously that's not good enough for a lot of a lot of fans. Do you think that Penn State's making the playoff next year in a 12 team format? Let us know in the comments. Let us know on replies to the video as well. Uh, let's get to the questions though in the BWI mailbag. So we're going to have a, the ability to answer this question a little bit better uh, this week. But Fitz, this is, we're going to start out uh, with this question for you because this has been maybe the number one question that I've put off that's been in the mailbag, that's been on the internet, that's been in the YouTube comments section. It's about uh, Alex Birchmeyer. So Gitney asks the question, but you can, however you want to phrase this, with the chatter among fans, the Cooper Cousins is going to come in and potentially push to play center What's the word on Penn State's last center prospect, which was what we talked about a couple years ago, Alex Birchmeyer? Redshirted last year, hasn't been a whole lot of information about him. Um, what do you know and what do you want to share about Alex Birchmeyer at this point in the 2024 cycle? Yeah, I wrote about Birchmeyer last week. Um, there's a lot. Uh, uh, it's a big offseason. You know, I, I know you don't want to say that about a freshman, especially a freshman offensive lineman, um, considering where you expect those guys to be. Um, Birch, Birchmeyer, at this time last year, we thought he was going to play. He didn't. That is the tough thing about projecting. And 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 by the way, that's not just in like a, a BWI thing, a Nate thing, a Sean thing, whatever. Like there were 
chatter in the program. This guy was going to be able to play right away. Didn't happen. Like he wasn't ready. And uh, you don't know, you don't fully know that you don't fully know where an offensive lineman is going to be until you throw him in pads and you put him against deny Dennis Sutton, for example. And that's what happened last year. And then I had himself a good spring. Um, but uh, no, it's, it, it, it's a situation where he needs to get stronger. He needs a full off season. Um, like it's, it's very different to, get onto the field, but also get onto the field where you can be a constant presence. And he's not there yet. Like from a strength perspective, from a lower body perspective, he's just not, wasn't there. And I, I did not have on my bingo card a year ago that uh, Burke Meyer would not get into a game, would not yeah. travel. You know, Jim Neono was, was a traveler. Like he was a guy that got into multiple games. Javon Williams got into multiple games. Anthony Donka got into multiple games and then played quite a bit uh, in the peach bowl. Um, so you, you can't, actually project these things until you get them in pads and, and we're going to see what he is able to do in the spring um in terms of center um but i think the move putting cooper cousins at center uh, with nick dawkins with whomever you throw back in there number one center is a uh, like an uh how do i say this center is a position that is center guard Penn State has yeah. their guys as guard centers, center guards. It doesn't matter which one's labeled first, but everyone has to be able to play those three interior positions. And then you, you everybody snaps. Like that's how they do it in, in practice. Because if your guy goes down, if your if your center goes down, that's that's one thing. If your guard goes down, you have to move somebody else in center and then move your center out to guard. Like they're, they're, all these things are intertwined. So how do you get the best five on the field? And you a lot be, of times yeah. your three best interior linemen, four best might not fit perfectly, right? Yeah. So so I have him at guard right now, like, and it's a situation where maybe, maybe he comes to center at some point, but uh, that's one of those things where you've got to get him set with, with guard, and then you've got to have him be able to snap. Other than that, I mean, he's three deep right now. That's what I would say. So we'll, uh, we'll see what happens with this physical transformation that he has to make to get stronger, to get, uh, to, I mean, to get in that, uh, to get in that mode where he needs to compete. So this time every year, uh, last couple of years, Penn State has made the second year players available for us to talk to. Nate, who are you interested in talking to? You know, kind of just broadening this subject to first year players that we're going to get an opportunity to speak to uh, for the first time. Who, what, what intrigues you? What piques your interest? Hmm. Javen. I think Javen. Joey. In what way? Joey, uh, well, they're <laughs> writing guys. I don't know. No, uh, look, J Javen is interesting because he plays at a position that there's a need right now. Mm -hmm. So, uh, based on what his experience was last year and kind of how they, in some ways, forced the issue with him a little bit, uh, it's, it's going to be interesting to see where he feels like he's at and how much growth he's made. Um, I, I, I don't know. I, who are you looking forward to talking to? <laughs> yeah, put him on the spot. Uh, yeah, I, I think that, you know, Birch Meyer comes to the top of the mind of somebody who is very talented and we haven't heard a whole lot about. And so what's uh, what was his first year like? What was his from an emotional standpoint, from an adjustment standpoint? Um, what were what's the what's the story? What's the narrative behind all of those things? And then um, I guess Tony Rojas would be the other guy I'd be interested in talking to of, you know, what went into him and in his transition from defensive end to linebacker that went so well and kind of how does he view you know i'm gonna ask x's nose questions and like how did you learn how to do x y and z and you know where do you think your strengths are and et cetera et cetera to get an idea of where maybe he plays next year so i guess those would be the two guys that that kind of stand out to me um fitz do you have do you have a second thought on maybe somebody you want you're interested in or you want to move on I'm curious. Uh, Dakari Nelson is always one that fascinates that's me. Um, Jameel Lyons is is one that I think can break in and be one of those guys um, that can play next year, along with Tony Rojas, um, Zion Tracy in there as well. Really interesting to watch Zion Tracy because you bring in two new corners, which kind of has been the plan um, all along to compete. And Zion was the guy that was like elevated there at the end. Played in the Peach Bowl, didn't have a great Peach Bowl. I mean, he was a corner for Penn State, didn't have a wonderful Peach Bowl. Um, but um, he has the talent to compete for that starting spot. And I think a lot of people were left in a sour with a sour taste because of the Peach Bowl. But this is a talented kid who played really well in special teams. So um, interested to see how that comes about. Um, we will see. I think there's five to nine inches of snow forecasted for tomorrow. <laughs> see if we can uh -oh. get up there and actually talk to James Franklin, yeah. Justin Lustig, uh, all those freshmen. Hopefully we get that. And uh, hopefully we didn't change the show for nothing. So that's uh, yeah. that's my pessimistic look at, look at everything. The yeah. running backs might be interesting. 
Yeah. Yeah. Cam Let's Wallace is talented. See where those kid, guys man. fit. Uh, Elliot Washington, somebody says in the chat, absolutely. Like how those guys are adjusting there from, from yeah. down south. That's kind of what I mentioned to Kari Nelson. Um, but uh, Elliot Washington is a guy you can throw in that. I mean, you can throw six names in that mix a corner and not blink an eye and say, yeah. okay, this guy's the starter. That's, you know, that, that kind of makes sense. Brian Barker fits. Hey, people, some, some people that are, uh, some people that are now at Boise State. Say Ryan Barker is a really good kicker, so um, we'll see. Uh, we'll see what happens with uh, with a couple of lefty kickers there. Um, you know, yeah, got some after snapper. yesterday uh, in the Super Bowl, missing an, uh, an extra point, kicking really important, really important as uh, everyone here on this show knows. Anyway, uh, this question fits. I'm coming back to you. A lot of these are, are kind of centered around recruiting, so I wanted to get you your thought on this one. See you guys yeah. later. Bye. <laughs> So uh, here, this question, we, we talked about this last week, but I feel like this question, I wanted to get this in front of you. Master Joker says, if the staff were to uh, strike out on uh, Zollers in Washington, do you think they'd be comfortable pushing for another quarterback or just taking Beckham Kritza? So I guess the question is, is it two QBs no matter what, or is it the guys that they're targeting? Um, those are the ones where it makes it a two QB class. I think more the latter, um, you, you know, they really like Zollers in Washington, but, but then on the flip side, like it's February, like they're going to go out in, in, uh, in April and go watch guys throw. And all of a sudden somebody like Grunkmeyer could pop up on the scene. You know, that's a, that, that is a situation there. I will say they're comfortable with Kritza. Like there's, you know, I, I have questions there about his, you know, the way that he's moved around and is he the style of quarterback that they're going to want to go with? That's, you know, a big reason they're still after the local guys in Zoller and Malik Washington. Um, but I think they're they're comfortable with his arm talent. They're comfortable with his talent. You know, like and he's and he's been one of the leaders in the 2025 class. So like they're not kicking him to the curb. I think that there's that misconception that he's a three star from Colorado. So it's going to be easy to just you know jettison him if they decide to do that. But now they're 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 happy with Kritza, but yeah. they do want another one. I mean, it, it's it's an arms race, double double nice. and there. Um, I didn't even try that, but you know you saw that one come together. Um, the hamsters running overtime today. Um, but uh, no, it's uh, it's a situation where you want to get as many talented arms as possible, especially when those guys are in your backyard. And Matt Zoller is a very important target for Penn State right now. Uh, Nate, I want to come to you with this question. Answer this how you feel, um, because it is a wide open question. But it, it's one that it's at the root of the whole conversation we've been having about the receivers this offseason. And it's like, what happened? RD24 says, what's up with the decline of wide receiver? watching some old highlights and Penn State's had some good receivers over the years through James Franklin's era at Penn State. What is up with the decline? Um, and I, I apologize. I copied that twice. He said, we're going to go wrong yes. for us. <laughs> and why is it hard to attract wide receivers with decent success at the position? I apologize for the uh, typo there. So let's, let's, um, I just want to make sure we're all on the same page here. Parker Washington left Penn State two, two years ago, right? Before last season, yeah. Before yeah. last season. So, of the entire time, we're talking about a one-year hiatus. Is that is that accurate? Yeah. Yeah. I would say 2021 was an issue where Parker and Mitchell Tinsley were good together, but they did lack a guy that you could rely on in certain situations. This, this idea that you can play cover one against Penn state's receivers and that locks them down started um, in 2022 with those two guys. And then it got worse once they left the program. That's at I, least my opinion. Yeah. I think, I just think that uh, it, it just being blunt, Keandre was supposed to be that guy this year. And for a variety of reasons, it didn't happen to that extent. And I, I'm not even sure Keandre had a bad year. He had an okay year, right? He, he, he did some good things. There were, there were some okay things about his season. Certainly not. And I think he would say this probably not to the level that he anticipated and certainly not to the, the level that Penn state anticipated. But the, the thing that is interesting to me is, you know, you usually don't get feedback um, publicly or privately uh, th that overestimates wildly expectations. Like it's usually the, the opposite of that mm -hmm. in, in, in my experience. Uh, and so I, I do think that 
I do think that Trey Wallace is probably a good receiver if we can see him. It, right. it, like if he if he actually plays football, if he's not hurt and is is able to have that opportunity, I, I, do they need more than potential? Yeah, of course. But I, I, like I do think that there are players in the program and Julian Fleming now among them that it's going to be interesting to see. I just. It is undeniable that it was a, an issue of this year, but mm. I'm not sure that I see it as a trend yet. I, okay. Like I don't, I don't think I can put it in that category yet. Um, you know, and guys, some of these guys, look the the, it is time, right? So if you're look if you're looking at the the career trajectories, right, it is time for Liam Clifford. It is time for Omari Evans. It is time for Caden Saunders, uh, Anthony Ivy. Right? If if yep. those guys are gonna do it, it's time. This this is the year that that has to at least start to blossom to the level that you need uh, to you know to feel good about the position. So we'll see. Fitz, do you, do you want to take a recruiting angle to this, or do you have some thoughts on just following up what Nate said? Because I think that either from that perspective is valid, and we haven't even touched like the transfer portal and all that effect on, on you know the roster and attracting talent through there. So, what angle do you want to take on all of this? I don't, um, but uh, <laughs> since I'm here anyway, uh, no, I, I mean it, it's tough because you, like you had for a while there the, the lack of continuity there from Gaddis uh, to Corley to Jared Parker to Stubblefield now Higgins like there's no there's not much continuity in there which which hurts, but at the same time you're kind of far enough removed from that where Stubblefield was here for a couple of years and yeah. Higgins now going into his second year so that shouldn't be an issue. I mean, the problem with Penn State's receivers is like everything has to hit for that to be like a good thing, like to be for that to be a strong point. You mentioned your Keandre has to, like Keandre is so freaking talented, man. Like there's so much talent that kid has, but it, it hasn't manifested so far. Trey Wallace has not been able to stay on the field. Julian Fleming, you know, like he has to be the top version of Julian Fleming for this to be a, a good group. Like that's that that's kind of where we're seeing it. I think that's the problem. Like the, the, the floor on this group, I think is low. And that's, that's not great. So yeah. ceiling high floor, low, you're kind of hanging out and festering in the middle there. So I think that, that that's the issue. And Nate mentioned some of these guys that, uh, that have to step up and, you know, I, I don't, it, it's tough to say, take your lumps because, you know, Malik McLean drops a ball and then we don't see him for a month. Yeah. Yep. Some of these guys do the same thing. Like they're the, that's the tough part that there's that's so tough to get around is how, how does that all work out? And I, I just, you can't go into it like blaring these trumpets about like, these guys are all going to be, they're going to be okay because you, you just don't know. And I think that's the problem with the low floor. Yeah. And I, the, the best case scenario and some of the things that I dug into the data, talked about what Andy Colton, Nikki can do um, efficiency of targets, the, huge problem last year for Penn State in my opinion of it was either short super short behind the line of scrimmage screen stuff or super deep like going deep and there was not a whole lot in the middle quarterback that's a part of it you know targeting certain players certain routes certain parts of the field but scheming up first reads where it's 10 yards down the field instead of five you know all of that stuff and positionally some of those things as well i think two tight ends there's there's a lot of different areas you can go with how the receivers produce to get all those data points that everyone's happy about that match the eye test of this is a good group um but we'll leave that there for now last question uh fits we're going to end with another recruiting question scott l asks as we're now almost to like the halfway point in the 2025 recruiting class, there are 11 players in the class. Any thoughts on who the leader or leaders of this class might be, whether committed now or someone they're trying to get who has that personality it's February, but this is a big, this is a big group at this point. So what do you think? Yeah. I mean, talked about crits a little bit ago. Like this is a guy that's uh, far, obviously far away, but he's bought in. Like that's the thing that you have to have is you, you have to have that buy-in. And I think he's been there. Um, I think Omari Gaines is an influential figure in this. Um, you know, he's a he's a guy in Jersey whose father very influential in the the, the youth programs there. Um, you look at it, and it's tough, man. It's a, it, it's a situation where you've got what five guys from Western Pennsylvania, so you're going to have that little cluster there. Um, and uh, who who is the leader in that group? Maybe Tyke Hayes. Um, we'll see see how that comes about. Xavier Thomas is probably a little bit quieter, but like 
you know, there's, uh, you know, you hear good things there. So I don't look at this class and say that there's one guy that really jumps out above all. Is that concerning? Maybe, but they're also, they have another half a class to, uh, to recruit here. So that's kind of where I'm coming from in the 2025 class. I don't, I don't, I'm not, I haven't really looked into it uh, all that much, but that's, that's my first thoughts there. And when he uh, gets to those final conclusions, bluewhiteillustrated.com, it's the first place you can find them. Uh, Nate, tell people what's going on this week with you and what you uh, want to get out of here telling people about at the site. Uh, well, if this thing actually happens tomorrow and we get a bunch of players, then players, James Franklin giving his first press conference of the new year, I think. If I'm remembering that correctly, uh, I would say yes. I right? you don't count the no the the bowl game was the yeah yeah this would be the first one, first one. So uh, you know it's been six weeks. It will be a good time to check back in. We'll have full coverage of that obviously uh, tomorrow if it happens, and um, yeah, go from there. Penn State basketball obviously on Wednesday should be a good week. Fitz, what about you? Uh, there was a comment made at the bottom. Penn State wrestling dominated Iowa. Just very satisfying for Penn State wrestling fans and maybe, you know, a lot of wrestling fans in general. So um, I, I think that was uh, that was cool. Uh, we're going to keep it up. Ryan's on vacation this week, so we're going to keep up the recruiting through me. Uh, we'll see how that's going to go. Michael Troutman committed uh, yesterday. It, for those of you that didn't catch that video, offensive lineman from New Jersey, uh, really good player. Uh, we talked more about that uh, yesterday. So uh, check out our stuff on that as Penn State continues to try and build out its class of 2025. Uh, not to repeat the things that they've said, but just to let you know, if uh, everything happens tomorrow, you can check out James Franklin's press conference immediately following its conclusion on the Blue White Illustrated YouTube channel, his comments here. And of course, um, if we can, we'll be talking to those players, have select uh, interviews and things like that all coming up. Maybe we'll even squeeze in a post conversation and all that stuff although it's going to be a long day if we're there so we'll see how all that shakes out but definitely check out james franklin the airing of that uh as it happens on the blue white illustrated youtube channel in the afternoon best way to know when it happens is to subscribe and enable notifications so that when we go live and when we have videos that pop up you are the first to know thank you to everybody here thank you to fitz thank you to nate we'll be back um on wednesday with more blue white illustrated bwi bwi live we'll talk to you then